Welcome, and thank you for joining today's training. Today's session will be focused on completing your OSHA 300, which must be posted from February 1st to April 30th each year. In this session, we will discuss the details of how to properly complete your log and the current regulatory requirements. So let's get started. As of November 1, 2018, the California Office of Administrative Law approved the ruling that requires California employers in the following categories to submit their Form 300A online by December 31st of each year. For up-to-date information on California requirements, you can visit the Department of Industrial Relations website found at the bottom of this slide. The ruling states that all California employers with 250 or more employees must submit their Form 300A online by December 31st, unless specifically exempted by Section 14300.2 of Title VIII of the California Code of Regulations. California employers with 20 to 249 employees that fall under the specific industries listed in Appendix H of the Emergency Regulations must also submit their Form 300A online. Additionally, California employers are recommended to follow the instructions posted at the Federal OSHA's ITA website found at www.osha.gov. Now, let's discuss the OSHA 300 reporting process. In this simplified decision tree diagram provided by Cal OSHA, we can see the process employers can utilize to determine if the injury is recordable on the OSHA Form 300. Starting at the top, did the employee get injured and was it work-related? If it is a new case, does it meet the recording criteria of the Form 300, which we'll discuss later in this presentation? If yes, then you must record the injury or illness. Although this diagram may make the process seem easy, there are several nuances that must be considered when completing your form. As you are already aware, the OSHA 300 log must be posted in a conspicuous location from February 1st to April 30th of each year, and it must include the total number of job-related injuries and illnesses that occurred in the prior year. It is recommended that you maintain the forms for at least five years. However, OSHA does provide a form in Microsoft Excel which will allow you to complete it electronically as well as store them permanently. The injury data on your Form 300 can be useful in extrapolating trends which can help you set safety goals. Thus, the more historical loss data you have, the more accurate your trends may be. We'll discuss how to use this injury data to set safety goals later in this presentation. There are several exemptions to completing the Form 300, but this is the primary one and that is if you have 10 or more employees, which includes temporary employees that were supervised on a day-to-day -day basis. Then you must complete the log. In the next few slides, we will review several did you knows as well as frequently asked questions. First, OSHA citations and inspections are public record and can be accessed at the OSHA website under the OSHA.gov link at the top of the slide. So, if having a clean safety record is required to bid on certain projects, then maintaining a proactive safety program is imperative. Second, employers that experience a serious citation must contact Cal OSHA within the required eight-hour time frame. For the definition of serious, you can find it on our website under our blog section. Employers that do not contact Cal OSHA within the required time frame can be subject to a $5,000 fine. Additionally, paramedics and emergency room technicians have protocols to report a serious injury to Cal OSHA if it is known to be work-related. Therefore, if you have a serious injury and the employee is taken by ambulance or is taken to the emergency room, it is likely that these providers will contact Cal OSHA. And thus, it is better that Cal OSHA hears from you, the employer, rather than one of these providers, as this will help mitigate potential OSHA fines and inspections. At the end of the year, when you're reviewing your Form 300 for accuracy, it can be helpful to compare it to your workers' compensation loss runs. Do the medical-only and indemnity claims that are on your loss runs match your OSHA 300 log? Note that some insurance carriers categorize first aid injuries as medical-only claims, so be sure to know which injuries are first aid and which ones are medical-only. We'll discuss first aid recording requirements later in this presentation. If you sent the employee to the medical clinic, on the doctor's first report, there is a box for first aid. And if it is checked, it is in fact a first aid injury. If it is not checked, it is more likely going to be at least a medical only claim and beyond first aid. Typically, first aid injuries and even most medical only claims don't result in lost time, or for the most part require modified duty under your return to work program. This is important for construction employers, as this should not impact your DART rate since those incidents didn't result in days away or restricted or transferred days. 
Are first aid injuries recordable on your OSHA 300? The answer is no, they are not. OSHA defines first aid in 14 different ways, which you can find on page 3 in the Form 300 Instruction Guide. And furthermore, California Labor Code 5401 defines first aid injuries as any one-time medical treatment and any follow-up visit for the purpose of observation of minor injuries, which you can see listed there on the left side of your screen. We encourage you to become familiar with these definitions as they are important to understand when determining if an injury is recordable or not. Here are a few more frequently asked questions, which you can find and more on the links at the bottom of this slide. First, is there a limit to the number of days away from work I must count? Yes, you may cap the total days away at 180 calendar days. If a case occurs in one year but results in days away during the next calendar year, do I record the case in both years? No, you only record the injury or illness once. If the employee is still away from work because of the injury when you prepare your form, then you must estimate the total number of calendar days you expect the employee to be away from work up to the 180-day cap. For example, if an employee is injured in December and the doctor says the employee will be off work for three months, with an expected return back to work on March 1st, then you would add the total number of days away starting with the date of injury through February 28th. Now if the employee heals quickly and is back to work less than the estimated days away, you can update your prior year's log to reflect the accurate number of days off work. Using the Excel 300 form, this can be easy to do. And for construction employers who are concerned with their DART rate, it is important to make this adjustment. Lastly, how do I count weekends, holidays, or other days the employee would not have worked anyway? You must count the number of calendar days the employee was unable to work as a result of the injury or illness, regardless of whether the employee was scheduled to work on holidays or had scheduled PTO. If you have more questions related to these topics, we recommend you review the OSHA links provided below, as there may be additional guidance on questions that pertain to your organization. For organizations that have multiple offices, the OSHA rule states that if you have multiple permanent offices, you must maintain a log at each of those different locations. However, you are allowed to maintain one log at your main office, given you comply with these two rules. First, injuries that occur at other locations must be reported to the main office and recorded on the OSHA 300 log within seven days. Second, each office must be able to generate that location's log within four hours. Thus, if an OSHA officer visits a site other than your main office and asks to see the site's 300 log, you must be able to provide it to that site within the appropriate time frame. If you use a cloud application, such as Box or Dropbox, you can create a centralized shared folder amongst all sites and store this form and any other safety-related material. Each site would then be able to access their respective forms immediately. Let's review a sample completed OSHA 300 form. Note that we have redacted the names to ensure anonymity. We'll focus our attention on the section inside the red box. The other columns, A through E, contain the general information regarding the injury, which include name, job title, date of injury, and location of injury. Column F is where you will notate the injury description. This section is important as the information should be provided to the insurance carrier. The specific injury details are important because this data will be captured on your workers' compensation loss runs. When reviewing your loss runs, you will then have accurate data, which can help you extrapolate trends such as injury type, body part injured, time of day, or cause of injury. Over time, aggregating this data can help you drill down into specific safety initiatives that will effectively mitigate these trends, and in theory, help you to reduce your risk and cost associated with workers' compensation. Now, let's look at a few columns in more detail. In this slide, we have magnified columns F through M to view the numbers more clearly. In particular, we'll focus on columns K and L, as these sum up columns H, I, and J. This client has been implementing a return to work program, which has minimized potential lost days as well as unnecessary workers' compensation claim costs, which we'll discuss in an upcoming slide. Here, we can see that the employer had a total of nine injuries and only experienced eight days away from work. As a result of this employer's return to work efforts, they were able to provide modified duty to these employees that resulted in 183 days saved. These modified duty days will provide a cost savings on their workers' compensation premiums, which we'll explain next. Upon completing your OSHA 300 log, you will then tally the total number of days away from work and then complete your OSHA Form 300A. 
Using the total number of days away, you can estimate how much temporary disability was paid on your workers' compensation claims last year. Those temporary disability dollars go into impacting your experience modification rate, or XMOD, and ultimately your workers' compensation premiums. Remember, it's the dollars that have an impact on your XMOD, and when you have lost days, you are incurring temporary disability costs. To estimate your temporary disability costs, you can use an average of $100 per day for a temporary disability rate. By multiplying the number of lost days by the $100 per day average, you'll then have an estimate on how much temporary disability you paid last year. In this example, we can see that this employer had 690 lost days. Multiplied by the average TD rate of $100 per day, this gives us an estimated $69,000 in temporary disability costs. Now, for many small employers, this would have a major impact on their XMOD and workers' compensation premiums. In the prior slide's example, the employer had saved 183 days away from work, which calculates to an estimated $18,000 in temporary disability saved. A side note here is that your XMOD is a rolling three years, so that is actually $18,000 saved per year for three years, which is estimated at $54,000 savings. So if you do not have an effective return to work program, we recommend you incorporate that into your strategic safety goals. Lastly, we recommend you calculate the average number of lost days and temporary disability costs incurred for the past five years. That data can then help you establish return to work and safety goals for upcoming years. In this training, we are not going to go in depth with how to calculate incident rates and DART rates, but we wanted to share some formulas which were taken off the OSHA 300 instruction guide listed there on the bottom left side of the slide. Additionally, if you are calculating your incident rates and want to compare your rate to your industry's national average rate, you can visit the Bureau of Labor Statistics at the link on the right of the slide. The BLS provides industry-specific incident rate data, which you can use to set goals and then benchmark your results against national averages. Each year, a small sample of employers across the U.S. receive this letter from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, which is part of the Department of Labor, just like OSHA. Those employers, which might be excluded from the reporting rules, are required to submit their OSHA 300 log to the BLS electronically. If you receive this letter, Yes, you are required to submit your log electronically, but no, they do not share this information with any other departments, specifically OSHA. The BLS is simply a data aggregator, where they use that collected data to calculate industry incident rates, from which employers can then compare their company's results against. Let's briefly recap today's training. First, your OSHA 300 form must be posted from February 1st to April 30th. Second, first aid injuries are not recordable. However, be sure to understand the first aid definition so that you accurately record the correct injury data. Third, use the OSHA 300 data to develop safety and return to work goals. In addition, measure your progress by comparing your results to industry averages at the Bureau of Labor Statistics website. Having a return to work program can help reduce lost days and unnecessary workers' compensation costs. Lastly, have a safety plan. Being proactive can help you reduce the cost and impact of workplace injuries, and thus, reduce the number of OSHA recordable injuries. Before we conclude today's training session, here are two post-training calls to action. First, download your training certificate, which will appear after this session, and save it to your files for proof of compliance. Second, provide that certificate to your insurance broker so that he or she can use it when they're going to market in negotiating what they call scheduled credits. Those credits are potential discounts on your workers' compensation premiums. The more workers' compensation and safety training certificates you achieve, the better you become at safety and administering your workers' compensation program, and thus the more leverage your broker has to negotiate those credits. We appreciate your time and interest in today's subject and hope that you have a great rest of your day.